There are disasters that burn into the sky and never go away. And then there are disasters that sink so deep, they almost disappear. No fireball, no live cameras, no sirens echoing through cities. Just steel vanishing into black water. Over the decades, Russia, and before that, the Soviet Union, lost multiple nuclear submarines to the ocean. Some with their reactors intact, some carrying nuclear weapons, some so damaged their crews never stood a chance. And each time one went down, the same question followed. What really happened down there? Because a nuclear submarine is not just a ship, it's a moving power plant, a weapons platform, a pressurized metal world carrying dozens, sometimes over a hundred people, running on a reactor that never sleeps. And when one of those fails beneath thousands of meters of seawater, you don't just have a wreck. You have a sealed off event, a black hole of information. The ocean helps with the silence. In deep water, pressure is not gradual. It's brutal. At just 300 meters, pressure is already enough to crush unreinforced steel. Many nuclear subs operate far beyond that. Their hulls are built like pressure vaults, engineered to endure forces that would fold surface ships like paper. But even those hulls have limits. And when those limits are crossed, it doesn't look like a slow movie style sinking. It looks like an instant collapse. The term used is catastrophic hull failure, which is a clean phrase for something unimaginably violent. In a fraction of a second, internal pressure is overwhelmed. The structure implodes inward. Compartments don't fill with water. They disappear. Sound travels faster than thought. And by the time anyone topside realizes something is wrong, it's already over. This is what happened to the Kursk in 2000. This is how several Cold War submarines from both sides likely ended. Not with a scream, with a vacuum. But beyond the human tragedy, there's another layer. The one people fear the most. Radiation. Nuclear submarines are powered by reactors, smaller than those on land, but still designed to run for years without refueling. When a submarine is operating normally, that reactor is shielded and controlled by multiple safety systems. But underwater, in a wrecked state, the timeline changes. A reactor doesn't just turn off like a switch. When control systems fail during a catastrophic event, emergency shutdown mechanisms, called scram systems, are designed to drop control rods into the reactor and stop the fission process instantly. Many nuclear submarines that sank did successfully scram before losing power or pressure. But here's the part no one likes to talk about. Even after shutdown, a reactor still produces decay heat, and its fuel is still radioactive. The question isn't, is it still dangerous? The question is, how dangerous, and for how long? Some nuclear submarines sit at depths where humans can barely reach with modern technology. The wreck of K-129, for example, lies deep in the Pacific. The American USS Scorpion, lost in 1968, rests at around 3,000 meters deep. Others, like Korsk, were in shallower waters, which created an entirely different problem. Because when a nuclear wreck is at reachable depths, the world starts worrying. If a sunken reactor casing fails over time, radioactive materials can potentially leak into the surrounding water. How much? That depends on damage, corrosion, depth, temperature, and containment design. The ocean does dilute contaminants, but dilution does not mean disappearance. It means slow spread. And slowly spreading radiation underwater is one of the hardest things to track, contain, or clean. Sensors placed near known wreck sites have, over the years, detected small traces of radioactive isotopes, not city wiping levels, not end of the world chaos, but not nothing either. Enough to keep scientists monitoring. Enough to keep military agencies quiet. Because if radiation leaks from a military submarine, it's not just an environmental issue, it's a geopolitical one. Acknowledging serious leaks means acknowledging long-term responsibility, and no country likes admitting long-term mistakes. That's where the silence thickens. Reports about submarine reactor integrity often come in fragments. Researchers publish cautious findings. Defense ministries issue vague statements about stable conditions. Independent expeditions sometimes locate wrecks and release blurred sonar images or short underwater footage, carefully edited, rare glimpses, twisted hulls, collapsed towers, torpedo compartments buried in silt and occasionally, strange biological changes around certain wreck sites, marine life adapting, avoiding, or in rare cases, accumulating unusual isotopes in small amounts. Not mutants, not monsters, just nature reacting to something unnatural. What makes the idea of a 10,000-ton radiation wreck so powerful in people's minds is that they imagine a bomb going off underwater. But that's not how it works. Reactors don't explode like nuclear weapons. They degrade, they corrode, they age. 
The danger isn't instant devastation. It's time, years, decades, sometimes centuries. The steel hull slowly weakens, salt accelerates corrosion, microfractures grow, seals degrade, and eventually, some barrier that was never meant to last forever gives up. That's why, even now, decades after Cold War submarines sank, they're still monitored. Satellites don't help. You need underwater drones, deep-sea probes, long, expensive expeditions, most of which happen far away from cameras, because some things are easier to deal with quietly. And then there's another layer people rarely think about, what about the weapons? Some nuclear submarines didn't just carry reactors, they carried warheads, torpedoes with nuclear payloads, strategic missiles designed to never be used, and when those systems went down with the ship, they went down as they were, unfired, unopened, locked. Those warheads are designed with safety systems to prevent detonation without proper arming, even in crashes. But again, design doesn't mean eternal. Material science isn't immortal. Over enough time, anything can fail. No one has publicly admitted a recovered nuclear warhead from a deep-sea wreck. No state likes to talk about attempts either, because retrieving them is dangerous. Leaving them is dangerous too. So they sit there, cold, dark, unmoving, not active threats in the dramatic sense, but long-term risks sleeping at the bottom of the world. And that's the part that makes submarine nuclear disasters different from anything on land. Chernobyl burned. Fukushima flooded. People saw it happen. Submarines vanish. And when they take reactors with them, they don't just become wrecks. They become sealed chapters of nuclear history, written in steel, salt, and silence. Not with explosions. But with weight, pressure, and time, ChatGPT said. And there's another dimension to this story that almost never gets attention. Not because it isn't important, but because it's too uncomfortable for governments and too invisible for the public. Responsibility. When a nuclear submarine sinks, it doesn't just disappear from military duty. It becomes a permanent object in international waters or contested maritime zones. It becomes an environmental liability, a potential hazard. And unlike a sunken cargo ship leaking fuel, you don't get to pump a nuclear reactor dry and move on. You inherit it. For decades, there are underwater graveyards in the Arctic and North Atlantic where multiple Soviet-era reactors and submarines rest. Some were deliberately sunk during decommissioning because proper dismantling was too expensive. Others were lost in accidents. Cold War priorities valued speed, deterrence, and secrecy over long-term safety planning. And now those decisions sit at the bottom of the sea. Occasionally, international research missions propose joint cleanup or containment efforts, reinforcing reactor casings, encasing wrecks in protective structures, removing particularly hazardous fuel components. But these ideas often collide with political reality, because admitting that cooperation is needed means admitting vulnerability, and no nuclear power likes that sentence. Plus, practical challenges remain brutal. Even with modern submersibles, remotely operated vehicles, and deep-sea robotics, working at depths of 2,000 to 4,000 meters is slow, expensive, and risky. Every operation is a calculated gamble between engineering possibility and financial willingness. So most wrecks stay where they are, monitored, observed, left alone, and nature, slowly, continues its work. Marine biology around some wreck sites has become a quiet area of study. Scientists have observed how certain microorganisms colonize metal hulls and how corrosion releases trace elements into surrounding sediment. Even without dramatic radiation leaks, these wrecks become artificial reefs of a strange kind. Not healthy ecosystems, but altered ones. Zones where metal and history twist into the natural world. Not life-threatening zones for distant populations, but localized pockets of long-term change. And that's the real danger of nuclear submarine wrecks. Not a sudden global catastrophe, but slow, persistent influence, like a memory the planet never fully forgets.